Now I would like to introduce someone whose name has been a part of ASHG for many years. Societies such as ours, which are scientific in nature, whose goal is to explain our science to each other, to nurture the next generation of scientists, to uh, make possible the free exchange of ideas in a cooperative and competitive environment, and who rely completely on our membership for volunteer work. Societies such as ours require an institutional memory, and we require at least someone who is both a scientist and has a long-term commitment to taking care of the society in its body as, a, as an activity in itself. That person, since 2001, has been Joe Boffman. Joe Boffman was Executive Vice President of ASHG since 2001, the first and thus far only person to serve in this role. She guided the society into a position of great respect and prominence in the policy circles of the federal government. Joe has retired from ASHG to assume the position of Senior Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs for the 12 campuses of the University System of Maryland. Joe is here officially to present the recipient of the ASHG Leadership Award, but first, we all would like to honor Joe. Actually, this is all about her, and Francis is here just as an excuse to get Joe onto the stage. Joe, no material gift will ever adequately thank you for what you have done for this society. Please know that what we are as a community is due to you. Your work for us will live on in our hearts and minds forever. And please come up and accept a very small gift from us. humbled greatly. It has been both a privilege and an honor to serve this society. Um, I have been a member for a long time. In fact, my membership number is 406. We're now in the 21,000s, by the way, um, as the, the list rotates. Um, I have loved genetics forever and will continue to love genetics. Um, and we'll be back every year. It was part of the negotiation in uh, getting my new job that I got, <laughs> I got this, got to come to this meeting every year. <laughs> Can't give it up. Um, humbled to stand among giants is um, a, one way to put it. And it is a, indeed a pleasure and an honor to introduce our next award winner. While, do we have Francis's picture? There we go. While Frances Collins needs no introduction at all to this group, it is my honor to provide a little bit of background information regarding the choice of Dr. Frances Collins for the ASHG Victor A. McCusick Leadership Award for 2012. The Leadership Award was initiated in 2005 with presentation to Dr. David Ramoyne, another of our giants. Later, we gave the award to Dr. Victor McCusick and then renamed the award the year Victor died. These giants will be sorely missed by all of us, but their legacy will live on and we will continue to follow. Dr. Francis Collins meets every criteria in every way to receive this award. Now, Francis was born in Staunton, actually Stanton, if you're from Virginia, uh, spelled Staunton, pronounced Stanton, um, and grew up on a small farm. He was actually homeschooled until sixth grade. During his high school years, he discovered that what he really wanted to do with his life was become a chemist. 
So he moved all the way, where's my arrow? He moved all the way over here and went to Mr. Jefferson's University, oops, in Charlottesville, the University of Virginia. Then he moved north where he earned his PhD in physical chemistry and at that time discovered biology and genetics. So he decided to follow that path and came back down, where's my arrow, bounced back down to the south um, in North Carolina where he earned his medical degree. Then he bounced back up into uh, Yale to do his residencies and a fellowship with Sherm Weissman. Then he looked west and went all the way to Michigan. Like Mr. Smith, he eventually ended up back in Washington. But in Michigan, he did some extremely important work. He was a bona fide pioneer, gene hunter. Francis, and then as a professor at the University of Michigan, collaborated with many, including Lam Chi Chu, to discover this cystic fibrosis gene. Following were collaborations that found genes for hunting disease, neurofibromatosis, and MEN type 1. At this point in his career, early, Dr. Collins was well on his way to meeting the first of the primary criteria for the McCusick Award which are professional achievements that have fostered and enriched the development of human genetics as a discipline. Then, in 1993, Jim Watson asked Francis to come to the NIH to lead this project known as the Human Genome Project, and then become director of the National Center for Human Genome Research, um, which became the NHGRI in 1997. Only slightly hesitant, Francis went to Washington. During this time, Francis continued his active laboratory and his team worked to discover important genetic risk factors for type 2 diabetes and most re recently the gene for Hutchinson-Guilford progeria syndrome. Most importantly, Collins, leading the ambitious International Genome Project, involved 16 major centers in six countries. And then the working draft of the genome was announced in June 2000, and the finished sequence was celebrated in April 2003, coinciding with the 50th anniversary of the Watson and Crick paper. The second of the qualifications for the McCusick Leadership Award is to exemplify enduring leadership and vision to ensure that human genetics will flourish. No doubt that Francis has done this. Not only has he discovered but he has been an ambitious leader, a visionary, and designed and led such a well-defined de project as the Human Genome Project. Francis called the Human Genome Project an exhilarating experience. The rest of the world knows that it changed science forever. The next phase of the award, I'm not so sure Dr. Collins meets exactly. It is that to ensure that genetics will be successfully assimilated into broader science, medicine, and health. Rather than being assimilated, Francis has ensured that human genetics will be the most important of the basic sciences, the most far-reaching and integrated of basic sciences, and that human genetics and genomics will help transform medicine and individualized care. Assimilate? No. Lead? Yes. Francis is very lucky to have a wonderful wife, Diane Baker, whom many of us know. He has been recognized in many, many ways. In 2009, Francis was nominated by President Obama to be the director of the National Institutes of Health, and he was unanimously confirmed by the Senate on August 7, 2009. While Dr. Collins has led the NIH comprehensively and put a new emphasis on the world, word health in that title, we all know that he'll always be a geneticist. Dr. Collins has initiated the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, NCATS. He's also helped prepare the human genetics community to think in broad implications in translational terms. I am sincerely confident in these very tough economic times 
Francis will be able to meet the critical challenge that NIH faces and do a great job of responding to the needs of the extramural scientific community. But when Francis comes up here and talks to us about this and charges this group to move with him to make these things happen, please listen and respond. The third of the requirements to be awarded the McCusick Leadership Award is to, quote, make major contributions to awareness or understanding of human genetics by policymakers and the general public. For over a decade, Dr. Collins worked on the, inst uh, the passage of the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. He was instrumental in that process. And Dr. Collins was one of the few that were allowed into the White House for the signing of that bill, thereby not only educating the public, but protecting the public from genetic discrimination. I don't, oops. Francis, you don't get to see that one yet. I don't think anybody else in the room, for example, can say they've been to the White House with an invitation by three different presidents for announcements of bill signing or award. There we go. Not only has Dr. Collins testified on Capitol Hill, he's written books, developed broad support networks, and he has sung his way into the hearts and minds of many, including here at one of the summer camps for kids. He's even taken on late night TV in the form of Bill Maurer and Stephen Colbert. Put most directly, Francis has been in the forefront of making the human genome come alive for the general public and accessible to all of us as a scientific com community. ASHG, of course, is not the only organization that has applauded Francis for his many accomplishments. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine. He's been given the Kilby International Award and was honored by the White House in 2007 with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And then in 2008, he was awarded the National Medal of Science. This introduction could go on for a long time, but I won't, do want to take just a minute to make a couple of more personal points. Every human geneticist knows that environmental factors are extremely important in the expression of a variety of traits. But very few, if the rest of us, in fact, see our environment in the form of DNA, quite the way Francis does. DNA is at Francis's fingertips every time he plays his guitar. It is on the floor of his house when you step from the dining room down to the living room, a beautiful inlaid form of the, of the DNA molecule. And he is inspired every day as he walks out his front door with a beautiful window with uh, this etching in it. I also want to emphasize that Francis believes in practical genetics and can be seen by these wonderful photos of his granddaughters, Nora and Bailey. Also notice for just a second the fun side and the serious side of Francis, even with the youngest generation. Scientist, physician, visionary leader, teacher, and caring person. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the American Society of Human Genetics, it is with honor that I present the 2012 Victor A. McCusick Leadership Award to Francis Collins. So thank you for a wonderfully personal and uh, humbling and flattering all at once introduction. And I'm really glad I got to be here for this surprise celebration of you. Uh, because Joe, you have done so much for this society. You have brought this whole enterprise into an entirely new level of professional capability, of recognition broadly in many different arenas. And your legacy is going to be very clear, even though you've moved back uh, into that academic environment at the University of Maryland. So congratulations for all you've done in these 10 years. And uh, 
we are all in your debt. Well, I only will speak fairly briefly, but I did want to say a few words about this remarkable award that I am now having the great honor of receiving, uh, particularly because it carries the name of Victor McCusick and because it has been an award given to other individuals who I have such respect for. And with a tip of the hat to the guy who won the election on Tuesday and who wrote a book called Dreams from My Father, I decided this is my version of Dreams from My Father, but in this case, the father is Victor McCusick. And he's your father, too, because he's the father of our field. He's the baby daddy of human genetics, if you will. And those of you in the room who never met Victor, and I'm sure there are many because we have such a wonderful way in this field of bringing many new generations every time we gather together. Uh, perhaps you're unaware of just all the ways in which Victor's influence shaped what happens here at this meeting and all the meetings that have preceded it. I've been coming to ASHG for more than 30 years. This is very much coming home, and it's a great honor to be able to be here with you in San Francisco. Here are the previous awardees, six remarkable leaders of our field, three of whom, I'm sad to say, are no longer with us. You heard a wonderful testimony to David Ramoyne uh, from Alan Emery, and in indeed, we very much uh, mourn the loss uh, of, of David just this past uh, May. I'm happy to say that uh, Charlie Epstein's wife, Lois, is here with us, and we're very much honored by your presence. And Victor McCusick's wife, Anne, is also here with us uh, this morning, which is just terrific. And also, uh, Arno himself, I saw, uh, sitting over there somewhere. And I don't know if Lee Rosenberg is here, but Lee was a very important mentor to me uh, when I was a fellow in human genetics at Yale, and he was the department chair. So these are remarkable individuals that I'm really honored uh, to be included uh, in any way uh, with their contributions and their stature. But I want to say a little bit more about Victor. Victor, our, our father of human genetics. And I'll tell you a little story. When I was a fellow in 1981, I was trained in internal medicine, and I went to Yale to do this fellowship in human genetics, and I discovered that most of the cases I was called upon to see were rather smaller than what I was used to. And pediatrics was uh, indeed quite an unfamiliar bit of territory. I was greatly fortunate that my attending in that uh, first rotation was none other than your Allen awardee from yesterday, Dr. Uta Franca. And I went to see uh, an uh, individual uh, child, very young, a uh, few months old, who had some form of intestinal atresia. And the story came out that there was a sibling also affected. And I had no idea what was going on. And I went back and talked to Uta about it, and she said she'd never heard of this as a familiar circumstance either. Let's pull down Victor's book. Well, of course, Victor had been at it already at that point for about 16 years. And there we were in 1981. Goodness, at that point, uh, there were only a few hundred entries in the Victor McCusick catalog. But one of them was uh, familial jejunal atresia. And sure enough, it fit precisely the description uh, of what we were seeing uh, in this child in the Yale New Haven Hospital. And I remember very clearly, we read through this, and Uta looked up at me and she said, there, you see, I think Victor should just win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and uh, he never got the Nobel, but he got the Lasker. And uh, I had the privilege of interviewing him for the Lasker. And if you want to go, that's still up there somewhere on the Lasker website. A wonderful meandering interview uh, with Victor about the many things that he had touched uh, during his remarkable career. So yeah, if you look at that graph, uh, by 1992, uh, the number of entries in Victor's book had reached uh, the, the thousands. And of course, uh, at that point, some other things were happening. The Human Genome Project got underway. It became possible to actually provide tools to make it much more feasible, not only to identify phenotypically the nature of genetic disorders, but to map their location in precise locations on human chromosomes if you had enough affected individuals to be able to do so. One of the things that I think the Genome Project did, which perhaps in many ways is at least as important as providing the original sequence of the human genome, was to introduce the concept that if you were producing data of this sort, 
It should be immediately placed in the public domain. What you see there is actually a photograph of the whiteboard at Bermuda in 1996 when the group decided that all of the data being generated by the Public Human Genome Project would be deposited every 24 hours so that people could start working with it immediately. And that, I think, has become now the ethic of this field, and well, it should be, and perhaps is responsible for the fact that those entries in McCusick's book became more and more entries associated with a molecular uh, understanding. And if you see the way in which that information started to grow beginning in the 1990s with those tools up until now, where we're up to something like 4,500 conditions for which the molecular basis is known. A phenomenal advance. And of course, now with exome sequencing coming on, the ability to be able to identify the cause of a disease with maybe only a single case or a very short list of cases is going to cause this graph uh, to lurch upward again. It's already started to do that. Uh, and much of that, I think, has been celebrated at this very meeting. Not only that, but we have the tools now building upon the sequence of the genome and the technology that arose from it uh, to be able to address other questions, such as what about the nature of common diseases and the genetic factors that play into that. The HapMap project, uh, certainly something Victor uh, was a fan of, made it possible to begin to look in genome-wide association studies and to identify, as you can see in uh, what is pretty near the current list of well-validated variants associated with common diseases, now uh, something in the neighborhood of a couple thousand uh, of these variants. Each of them pointing us towards a pathway that we might not previously have appreciated is involved in disease risk. And with additional efforts now coming to the fore with this remarkable deluge of discoveries uh, being printed out in 30-plus papers in Nature, Genome Research, Genome Biology, Science, and Cell, uh, just in the last month or so, the ENCODE project has put us in a position uh, to be able to understand the function of the genome at a pace that I think uh, never could have been imagined even a few years ago. My own laboratory continuing to work on type 2 diabetes in a wonderful collaboration with many other members of this society. Uh, now finding it possible to be able to characterize the epigenome of the human pancreatic islet at genome scale and to identify ways in which those variations that are associated with disease risk uh, map to functional elements, enhancers, insulators, and so on. And by the way, I'm looking for a new postdoc on that project. If anybody in the room is interested, send me an email. So this is the good news, this part of it in terms of the discovery. The part that I think we should all now redouble our efforts on, and that's very much represented at this meeting, is the not so good news. That of those 4,500 disorders, only about 250 of them have an acceptable therapy. So we know the cause. These are circumstances where the molecular basis has been revealed, but we're not in a position to be able to go beyond diagnosis to therapy. This surely must be one of our greatest challenges and our greatest opportunities at the present time. And I would certainly like to exhort all of you who are working in this field to think about ways to connect up what we do so brilliantly now in terms of molecular basis of disease with therapeutic opportunities that may emerge that perhaps don't happen just by chance, but by intention. We want to be able to figure out how to take that uh, basic science about the genome and translate it into medicine that is precise, focused on the individual and a molecular understanding of their disease. Certainly in cancer, we've come a long way along that pathway with the ability with individual tumors now to be able to read out every single letter of the DNA code and to be able to make a list of what is driving that particular cancer and arrive pretty soon within the next few years at a circumstance where most individuals with cancer will have that kind of information determined on their cancer in order to be able to make the match with the appropriate therapeutic. And the list of therapeutics is getting pretty long. This is just, I think, a fairly comprehensive, but I probably left a few out, list of the targeted therapeutics that are based upon an understanding of pathways in the cancer cell that are actionable. And so we are on the path towards being able to achieve the precision approach to cancer. But what about rare diseases where there's perhaps less motivation, uh, less uh, a, uh, of a private sector motivation anyway, to try to find therapeutic options? In many ways, academics need to rise to that occasion. I think we are seeing that happen in really gratifying ways. My own lab, having had the privilege of finding the cause of Hutchinson-Guilford progeria, were able in just four years, by understanding the nature of that mutation in lamin A, uh, to be able to propose a therapeutic option 
which got into a clinical trial which has now been published just a couple of months ago showing what appears to be benefit to the cardiovascular aspects of this disease based upon the introduction of a therapeutic which was not designed for progeria but for cancer but which happens to hit the right pathway. And I can't help but also focus on another disease because so much has happened in just the last year or so as an example of how, albeit hard fought, we can take those molecular discoveries and push them forward to therapeutics. Cystic fibrosis, the most common fatal genetic disease in people from Northern Europe, with its gene being discovered in 1989 and published in this issue of Science with this five-year-old boy on the cover, showing that 90% of patients have this one particular three-base pair deletion, but other mutations occur as well. One of them, G551D, becomes important for what has happened next because this is a mutation where the protein actually gets to the cell surface but doesn't activate when it's supposed to, whereas Delta F508, as many of you know, also has a processing defect where it is misfolded and therefore retained in the endoplasmic reticulum and doesn't get to the membrane. Over these last 20 years, thanks to a great deal of hard work supported by NIH, by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, and by other groups, has led to an understanding of the function of this protein and to the identification of potential therapies, but frankly, that has been hard fought and often frustrating. In 2009, just three years ago, in a partnership between Vertex and the CF Foundation, this uh, compound, Ivacaftor, uh, Kaleidico being the uh, uh, trade name, was shown to enhance apical membrane chloride transport activity of the G551D protein, which does get to the membrane but doesn't activate. Well, this drug makes it active. And that then led to a clinical trial and a very dramatic and impressive result in a phase three trial with only a modest number of uh, participants, but the results were so striking that this was clearly seen beneficial and approved by the FDA in almost record time with improvements in lung function, weight gain, reduced sweat chloride, dramatic stories one hears of individuals with G551D who are on the lung transplant list, who are no longer on the list. Some of them are now actually back at work. But of course, G551D is only 4 to 5% of individuals with this condition. What about Delta F508? To attack that, one certainly needs a strategy that will also deal with the misfolding problem. And to, uh, Kaleidico alone would not be expected to be effective. The compound VX809 developed by Vertex was designed uh, through a very uh, sophisticated assay and screening strategy to assist the folding of the protein. And a trial is now underway, including, by the way, this same young man. This is Danny Bazet. That was him on the cover. That's him today. He's now a participant in this trial because he is a Delta F508 carrier, as most CF uh, individuals are. And data just presented, but not yet published, and I don't think it has been seen at this meeting, shows that the combination of VX809 and Avacaftor, that's over here, if you measure FEV1 as an indicator of response, notice the, the trial design here, the first 28 days, just VX809, which you would predict would, if it's going to do something, uh, help with the folding. But even if the protein gets to the membrane, it's not going to necessarily be activated. So over here, you put the two together. And what you can see is the comparison between placebo and treated individuals with the blue bars showing you a shift, maybe not as dramatic as one would hope for, but clearly a significant result in the direction of benefit from this combination therapy. Lots more work to do here, but this is, from my mind, a very exciting example of how by hard-fought efforts to understand the molecular basis of disease, apply the most cutting-edge methods of assay development and high-throughput screening, do carefully designed a clinical trial design, uh, which is individualized based on mutational status. One can make progress in a disease that has vexed us for decades. And I could point to other disorders, even sickle cell disease, after all these decades, where this kind of progress is starting to be made. In order to assist with that, the NIH put in place and has now been in place for a little less than a year, a new center, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, whose URL is here. The goal really was to do in a certain way what was done for molecular studies of disease by the Genome Project, providing tools. Well, this is to provide tools to do the translational step that comes next. This is not intended to compete with the private sector, and it will not, but it actually provides opportunities 
to move through that translational pipeline to identify what the bottlenecks are and to try to knock them down. And this is off to a very exciting start indeed. Well, those are the bits of good news. I want to finish, though, by an exhortation to all of you. We are, I think it is fair to say, at the most dramatic moment in terms of the promise of biomedical research that anybody can recall. We're on this exponential phase of understanding how life works, how disease occurs, and what to do about it. That makes it really remarkable to be involved in this field, and I hope all of you feel here this morning that sense of really being privileged to take part in a revolution of this sort with this promise for the future. And yet at the same time, those of us who've been involved in the study of biomedical issues over the course of a few decades cannot recall a time when our enterprise was under greater threat than it is right now for its support. This diagram shows you what has been the support of the NIH over the course of the last 15 years, beginning with this wonderful doubling that happened between 98 and 2003, but then followed by a flattening of the budget. And if you look at the yellow bars, that tells you effectively what's happened to our ability to do science, our purchasing power, if you will, because inflation has been eating away at the support that we counted on. And we're now 20 percent down from where we were in 2003. The consequence of that, as all of you know, is that the ability to get your grant funded uh, through NIH has dropped from a success rate of perhaps 30 percent on the average over the last 40 years to now well under 20 percent. And we have facing us on January 2nd the possibility of something called the sequesters, which if it were to happen would result in an immediate loss of 8.2 percent of the NIH budget, two and a half billion dollars, which would have an absolutely devastating effect on our ability to do anything new for this year or our years to come. Very critical decisions are going to be made in the course of the next two months. As all of you leave San Francisco and go back to your institutions, this would be a critical time to talk to your leadership and ask what have they recently done to try to share the news about the value of biomedical research for human health and for our economy. The story is incredibly compelling, but is it being told? Because we, like many other things the government does, are basically on the table right now for decision making about what kind of support is likely to happen, even as we wrestle with our terribly difficult fiscal situation. The case can be made and must be made that if you want the future of America to be bright, investing in science and technology, and particularly biomedical research, is one of the smartest things we can do, both in terms of improving our health opportunities and stimulating our economy. But that message is not just going to be heard because it's real. It has to be conveyed. There are some tools that might help you. One that I'll point you to is a video which came from a celebration of science that we held in Washington and invited some influential members of Congress and staffers and many other advocates uh, to come and uh, go through this experience with us. And the video, which is available on the NIH director's page, which runs only nine minutes, I would urge you, if you're going to try to make a case for the value of medical research, to consider using this as a way of telling stories, stories that relate to what science is able to do and how it is affecting people's lives right now. At that event, uh, Eric Cantor and Steny Hoyer, uh, both present and saying very promising things about medical research, those are voices that definitely uh, we count on uh, to, to lead this effort. And in the middle here, you will see at the end of this a description of what science can do that comes straight out of the field of genomics. That's the Beery family. That's uh, Noah and Alexis, the twins, who after deteriorating neurological si si situations were found by the Baylor College of Medicine Genome Center to have a rare mutation which could be readily managed by appropriate understanding of the neurotransmitters that they didn't have the ability to make and needed to be able to be supplemented with. Just a remarkably and inspiring story. So please use this and other features you will find on the NIH homepage that will also document the way in which the economy of our nation is deeply dependent upon the biomedical research enterprise. Don't be shy. Let me promise you, nobody else out there is being shy to defend uh, the nature of what they are doing, and we should not be either. We have a wonderful story to tell. We're engaged in a noble enterprise. So it's a challenging time, but we've seen other challenging times. Just finish with a quote from Abigail Adams writing to her son, John Quincy Adams. These are times, 
in which a genius would wish to live. All you geniuses out there, these, this is your moment. It is not in the still calm of life. Well, nobody could say we're having that. Or the repose of a Pacific station that great characters are formed. Great necessities call out great virtues. So there are many virtues represented by this society, by the work that you do. Great necessities are calling. Our future is bright, but we must not be shy to explain to the world what we do and why it matters. Thank you all very much.